to Finlos Lives. Today I just wanted to take time to discuss some ideas about being a grown-up, or maybe just growing up, especially when considering being a full-time parent and partner. And a lot of this conversation is going to be discussing healthy attachments and what that really means. And I think a lot of the conversations around healthy attachments centers on parenting and attachment style parenting. I've even talked about that in past episodes. But attachment style parenting is the idea that parents establish healthy patterns for security between parents and children. And a lot of people sometimes think that people who follow this sort of a parenting style or who use this sort of a parenting style uh, might be spoiling the child. And I just don't think that it's actually possible to do that. Uh, when we think about kids and how they communicate, they often are expressing very specific needs. And so the, again, attachment parenting is the idea that parents, as quickly as they can, try to meet the child's need. So that way there is a healthy foundation, a secure foundation for trust. And ultimately, the idea is that this creates a healthier relationship long-term, that the child grows up to feel safe and secure. And because of that secure foundation, they are better able to judge risks and take risks that are healthier and safer. And ultimately, they become more independent. And this is a really interesting idea because I'm using my own experience sort of to extrapolate here, but I can speak for uh, many of my friends and many of my peers and people generally my age, kids who grew up in the, the 80s and 90s, latchkey kids, that sort of thing, as we were transitioning between old and new technologies and differing ideas of parenting, we were often left alone. And... You know, as our boomer parents were working full time or uh, divorce suddenly becomes a much more common occurrence as ideas around divorce are normalized, as we as, as adolescents gain access to exponentially more types of information at our fingertips, as we come to understand that that we have grown up with outdated and unrealistic relationship expectations. All of those things create these sort of insecure attachments, attachments that are based on a lack of presence sometimes, or an intermittent pre presence, which could be sometimes even worse. And it's also important to remember that healthy attachments can and should be present in all types of relationships, whether we're talking about parents or romantic or familial or even friendships. We should be striving to create these healthy attachments with all of the long lasting relationships that we have in our lives. So all of this uh, to just to kind of introduce you to the fact that, uh, or to the reality or to my experience over the past few days where Eva, my partner, has been traveling. It's been five days. And, you know, travel is, is not something new. Both of us have had to travel for work. Both of us have, have taken personal trips. But it's an interesting opportunity for me to uh, take some time for introspection and to re-examine our relationship, to do a self-check, and to consider whether or not the relationship that we have is based on healthy attachments or is it a relationship based on enmeshment. And enmeshment is when a relationship has developed boundaries which are permeable or unclear. And these unclear boundaries, these changing expectations or little to no stated expectations they can cause mistrust 
Um, they can cause isolation, resentment. They can lead to poor communication or lying. And ultimately, it causes harm to the individual and relationship as a whole. And it leads to very unhealthy and often irreparable relationship dynamics like codependency. So all of this lead in, all of these definitions and all of these ideas is just a way of me just to say that in the past, I've had a tendency to operate on the, the negative side of that dynamic with unhealthy attachments. And there are many reasons why I have developed these patterns of, of forming unhealthy attachments in my relationships, and none of which are really pertinent to this particular conversation. But thanks to a lot of work, both with individual and couples therapy, and lots of patience and difficult conversations with Eva over the course of years, you know, I think that we have reached a place where our relationship is mostly anchored by healthy and nurturing attachments with each other. And I say mostly because those deep-seated insecurities, the past harm, and the lifelong trauma coping mechanisms, they can make the trust needed for healthy attachments hard. But mostly, what it takes is a degree of honesty that most people are neither prepared nor comfortable with. When a person who is an integral part of your daily life is suddenly not present, no matter how much you prepare, life can feel a little destabilized. And add the needs of children into that equation and things can stretch beyond our regular means of managing stress very, very quickly. And so much of that dysregulation, that out of control spilling of emotions is triggered by the conversations we have with ourselves the self-destructive internal monologue of doubtful questions. Where are they now? What are they doing? Who are they with? Are they thinking of me? Do they care? What am I going to do when they aren't here? How am I going to get everything done? What if I mess up? What if the kids mess up? What if I mess up the kids? What if they aren't happy to see me when they get back? What if their flight is canceled and all the plans change? Am I really able to do this? Are they taking this trip to get away from me? Do they even want to come home? And of course, those questions are specific to this situation. But whenever these insecurities pop up, these are the types of doubts and questions that come up for anybody. And all of those questions that bounce around are just results of anxiety. And we are trained to repress and suppress anxieties. Of course, these methods of coping are temporary and only lead to worsening anxieties as the pressure builds. Without a truthful engagement with them, that pressure finds its own ways to escape, mostly in ways causing harm. We explode at the kids. We get frustrated at ourselves. We blame others for those frustrations. We procrastinate. We shame spiral. We put the negative self-talk on repeat. We self-medicate to dull the noise. We neglect ourselves and everything around us, and we go numb. And I know all of this better than I would like to admit. I am a complicated system of interconnected biology and psychology, and so are you, and so is everyone you interact with in the world. I like to think the difference between those who perpetually seem like they have their shit together and those who don't is that the former remain aware that each of us is complicated and messy and have the potential to do harm as well as good, while the latter can only manage to consider the thoughts and feelings they are having and not consider the harm that their selfishness causes. And this is why good relationships, meaningful and deep relationships, persistent relationships that grow and remain flexible take work and constant maintenance. And when your partner is away on a trip for five days and when they call to check in and all you feel is a sense of thankfulness that they are finding ways to experience joy even amidst the chaos that is traveling away from home and family, 
it makes the work worth it. And when they tell you that they are glad that they will be home tomorrow, you know that they mean it because so are you. And now for what we've been watching, I'm going to give you a quick review of the short series called Boo Bitch on Netflix. It premiered in 2022 and stars Zoe Margaret Colletti as Gia and Lana Condor as Erica. The setup is that you have two best friends nearing the end of their senior year, and they worry that they haven't left a mark or had any great or meaningful experiences. We learn that Erica actually has a silly nickname that most people think is her actual name, and that name might be a little bit racist to boot. But then the duo decide to take a risk and go to a high school party where all the cool kids will be. It was announced on the senior text channel to which Erica wasn't included because she's unpopular, get it? As hinted by the title, one of them ends up dead, crushed beneath a moose, and spends the rest of the show as a ghost and trying to complete the unfinished business of living her best high school life with the aid and support of the other surviving friend. That's the plan at least, but of course things don't go to plan. The premise of the show is absurd. The dialogue and events are absurd. The relationships and how they come together are absurd. And yet they are treated with care and a kind of truth that breaks through all the absurdity. The writing, intentionally or no, creates a sort of caricature of Gen Z life, the desire for continuous attention, the highs and lows of social media and influencer life, and a seeming inherent understanding of the transience of everything that, while being obviously stretched to the extreme, still accurately captures some of the struggles of young people. Things unravel as they do in these high school narratives as one character builds a new life of popularity only to be knocked back down by her own self-centeredness. Thankfully, the creators of the show knew better than to stretch things out too far, and things draw to a rather poignant close after eight half-hour episodes. There is a lot of heart in this brightly colored, pleasantly diverse, and frustratingly likable tragicomedy and the message that it ultimately delivers about how young people, and really all of us, cope with the painful aftermath of death is quite lovely. That's it for this episode. If you have comments, questions, or suggestions for future episodes, please contact me via social media or email me at finloslives at gmail.com. Or you can leave a voice message via the SpeakPipe app at finloslips.com. If you like what you heard, please share the podcast. I look forward to our next conversation. <laughs>